Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Taylor, and welcome to episode 122 of the FinTech Insider Breakfast Show. We had some technical difficulties this morning. It took us a little bit longer than usual, uh, but believe me, Michael freaking barely sorted us out. So we are here. So uh, I'm sure you're joining. I'm sure you wonder why we're a few minutes late, and hopefully you never know. Welcome to episode 122 of the FinTech Insider Breakfast Show. In this show, of course, we bring you the brightest and best from FinTech and banking every single weekday, straight to your homes, live here on LinkedIn. Today, we are joined by the one and only Emma Steele, who's Investment Director of the Fair by Design Fund at Accenture Ventures. Today, we're going to talk about the poverty premium and how household incomes are being locked into poverty, uh, or poor, I have low income households, so even are being locked into poverty simply for being poor. Morning, Emma. How's it going? Morning, Simon. Good. Thank you. Excited to be here. Thank you so, so much for being with us. And thank you, audience, uh, for joining us today and, and putting up with those uh, slight delays. Um, but we hope you'll send us some comments uh, all about the poverty premium or asking Emma what Extension Ventures is, what's fair by design. But I'm going to start there. Uh, Emma, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do at Extension? Yep, yeah, so, so I uh, look after the Fair by Design Fund at Ascension Ventures. And Ascension is a UK pre-seed and seed um, fund that's been around since 2015, I think. Um, mainly doing tax efficient uh, funds, so SEIS and EIS annually. Uh, but we now have over 100 companies uh, in our portfolio. Um, and we bid for the Fair by Design Fund about three years ago, which is when I, I joined. Phenomenal. And um, the Fair by Design Fund, what is that? So the Fair by Design Fund is it's it's a fund that's designed to tackle the the poverty premium in the UK by investing in in uh, tech founders that have that are coming up with innovations that tackle some of the drivers of that poverty premium um and it's uh it's been set up uh so three years ago it's a 10-year fund and it's it's structured as a as a classic and gplp um seed fund um and we've now i think we're 50 percent deployed but we are we're, we're a 10 million fund and trying to raise another another five um extension at the moment because um we we do think that the, the 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 kind of theme of the poverty premium is relevant um to a a post-covid world mm -hmm. um but we've we've got 12 businesses in the portfolio right now and from an irr perspective actually it's it's performing pretty pretty strongly compared to to a kind of non non-impact fund um so yeah phenomenal stuff i think that that impact space uh, often gets looked at uh, by investors as being a space that uh, it, it's impact or return. And actually, not only can you have both, sometimes the return with impact fund is even better than uh, than, than some of the non-impact funds. So it's really powerful. You've used the term poverty premium a couple of times. Do you want to just explain what that is? Yes. So, the, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it sounds like quite an academic term, but really the, the poverty premium is all about paying more just because you're on low income. So it's a, it's a tax on the poor across several different sectors um, and, and driven by different things. So, um, you know, it's it's affecting um, sectors like energy, for example, when when people are um, on, on prepayment meters, for instance, you pay more than um, when you're on direct debit. Um, there's things like um, insurance, insurance premiums tend to be more expensive uh, if you're um, from a certain postcode. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it affects every area of life. And yes, um, financial exclusion is a big driver to some of them. So, so access to fair credit and uh, you know, things like the, 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 the vulnerability of, of people in the gig economy um, from an income income stability perspective, all of that means that they tend to be excluded or pay more um, for 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 credit. Uh, mm. It's so uh, crazy that uh, because the market season is risky, they end up having to pay more 
um, but actually there's a series of things that sort of become a become a trap, become a bit of a cycle that, that self reinforces here. There's a really great stat I have in my notes here that around 14 million people in the UK uh, who live in poverty pay extra for a range of those goods and services. Everything from energy to loans to insurance, as you say, yeah. um, they, they lock the people in that cycle. So how does the cycle work? Yeah, I mean, you know, a typical example that we often take is a is a is a single mom. Um, she's she's got a part time cleaning job. She's on she's currently on a on a um, variable fuel tariff that hasn't been switched from a from a fixed tariff. So she's paying mm. it to, up to two hundred quid extra a year um, just because she's not switched to the cheaper tariff. Then you know she she. Um, is she doesn't have any financial cushion and her her washing machine breaks so she can't um she can't finance a new one so she takes out a payday loan mm. on which which is which is compound on the the existing debt that she had from you know a previous car accident that she's still paying off so it's, yeah. that, it's that kind of thing where where you know one one premium cannot be taken in, in in isolation people's kind of everyday life is affected in every way by it and, and simple things like a washing machine breaking can end up in, in this debt spiral because you need the cash now and aren't getting from the mainstream lenders but also there are these other traps sort of like installment purchases of everyday household items that look like a low monthly or weekly fee yeah. is, is it worth delving into it are installments necessarily bad or good well, I mean, if you take if you take the the rent to own market, like if 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 you know if she was gonna um, go to to a bright house of this world, for example, then that is bad because a lot of um, a lot of these business models actually you know artificially inflate the the retail prices, perhaps making the interest rate look look better than it is. But then you've got many many hidden fees on the back of it as well and late payment fees that that mean that actually you end up paying a lot more than you that you can budget and if somebody's income is uncertain and also therefore they feel more in control and cash or they're not as financially literate then they end up balancing bills and paying one thing but not the other thing and then incurring the charges and maybe not always understanding which one has to be paid first yeah and there's this kind of traditional uh, concept of, of of that buying in bulk is necessarily cheaper and and you know paying in installments should be should be charged but you know i guess that a lot of that was driven by by old um supply chain um arrangements which is not necessarily the case now with with kind of increased digitization mm, indeed i mean i look at the the, the buy now pay later companies that uh, one could argue could be getting younger people into a debt trap but at the same time have the lowest uh, impairment fees out of almost any lender it's one percent or less and they uh, typically use the merchant to fund the discount so if you're buying some clothes from asos asos is paying for your risk and actually that's in the customer's interest so type of lending that's been around for a very long time but it now being digital potentially has some more some more ways to go um, yeah. Do you think those sort of products offer a threat, though, to to low income people? Could they, could they be seeing the zero percent and thinking it's free? Well, I mean that that's pretty much the core of the the the, the impact due diligence that we do when we when we meet um, fintech founders that are kind of coming up with these new uh, tech based innovation to try and make things more more affordable, more transparent. I think it's all about well, it's all about firstly the 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 founder. And what the founder vision and intention is for for the product, but it's also about due, dilig due diligence in the supply chain. So, how how much transparency is there? Um, you know, what 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 are their approach when it comes to late payment fees? Um, what if any open banking partner are they are they using? And what's their what's their affordability calculator kind of approach? And in that, who are they excluding or including? Um, so I mean I'm biased, but it's uh, it's companies like uh, Credit Kudos partnering with with someone like Credit Kudos, who's uh, a, a, an open banking based credit bureau, will will automatically include a lot more people um, in the, the the services than than if you were partnering with a traditional credit bureau, for instance. Yeah, so totally. it's all about the supply chain.
I just want to remind anybody that's watching along, do send in any questions if you've got them. We'll, of course, uh, try and get to as many as we can. Um, and just want to ask a quick question before we before we do get to um, the, the questions that are coming in. Uh, there's, there's everyday examples of things that cost more. You gave some examples of borrowing, but um, we have a thing here about daily bus fares costing more than monthly. Um, yeah. Other things that you're seeing being done about this sort of thing, what are some good examples? I mean, it, actually, looking for for transport innovation is has been quite hard. Actually, there's not a lot of deal flow around there, and and a lot of the mobility innovators are not, you know, targeting that that portion of the population. Um, but I mean, we've we've um, we're seeing a lot more now um, innovators that are trying. I mean, we're, we're probably just about to to. Um, invest in a company that's trying to do a kind of Uber pool for the regions, for example, where underserved um, bus routes are replaced with kind of large, large uh, taxis or, or kind of small coaches and um, using kind of partner partner models with councils and recruitment agencies and supermarkets to, to subsidize part mm. of the, part of the, the journey. Because um, it is in the interest of, of said kind of stakeholders to to support people getting getting to work or getting to the shop. Absolutely. So in a weird way, the times we live in have sort of uh, and maybe even accelerated the realization of the importance of uh, we instead of calling people key workers. Yeah. And, and recognizing the role that people play in society that do these essential things that we can't live without yeah. and um, had undervalued for, for so so long. There's a good question from Dan Feeney who asks, can the FCA do more to address the poverty premium? And I guess I'll add to that, what role can regulators play more broadly? Yeah, I mean, that comes to, that touches on the work that the, the Fair by Design campaign does. So I haven't, I haven't mentioned that, but we are, we are a program that's basically a fund and a, a campaign. And the fund is managed by us and the campaign is um, hosted by the Barrow Cabaret Trust. And their entire mission is, is to tackle the poverty premium, but not from an innovator's perspective, but more from an influencing uh, the key stakeholders around the poverty premium. So, you know, that's that's government, local, lo local government, uh, corporates, it's housing associations, and it's, it's the regulators. And the, yeah, yes, they can they can do a lot for it, and uh, you know they are. To be honest, they are. They are uh, working a lot uh, to try and you know, try and kind of make things more inclusive by design, um, and, and encourage policies for 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 more inclusive design. But also um, introducing various caps. Um, and, you know, I know recently in the past couple of years, there's there's been a cap introduced around energy tariffs as well, for for instance, and that's that's actually had an impact on 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 the poverty premium, a positive impact. So, um, you know, they can do a lot. It's just it, it's a question of working with every stakeholder, not naming and shaming, but just showing what can be done and that there's a business case for doing it. Mm, indeed, and, and I think that business case point leads to a good question here from Richard Short that says, uh, you know, what is the impediment, in, the largest impediment in your view to tackling this poverty premium? What's, what's holding it back? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's old, old kind of business practices, things that, that people used to say cost more. So, so if you break down the cost uh, of a service, you know, the, the, the underlying transaction costs, for example, of servicing a banking customer may be higher or may have been higher if there was more physical um, physical mm -hmm. branch uh, or, or kind of one-to-one -one attention given to more vulnerable customers. Um, there's, there's maybe kind of old uh, increasing underlying costs when you're, when you are a, a, a kind of riskier or more vulnerable person. But now, I mean, with technology coming in and things like uh, cloud banking, open banking, you can really reduce, uh, completely reduce the, the, the cost of, of providing an underlying service and spend more time and, and free up the resource to spend more time with, with people who need the one-to-one -one attention. Um, and, and, you know, with with um, the, 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 old, the old market failures around uh, not being able to, to have any information on those people. So, so the fact that there's four million people in the UK still that are considered thin file customers in terms of their yeah. their credit rating um, means that you know just by nature you can't you can't actually calculate the true cost of risk for these people. So they're they're automatically left out of of financial services. But things like open banking is a great way of solving for these market failures. 
and 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 actually having a more accurate estimation of, of the true cost of things and the true true um, risk of, of something. I really love this idea that actually the the sort of the success trap of banks or what worked in the the past has has kind of led to some beliefs that actually hold them back as an industry from a segment of society that needs them and could be could be even profitable could yeah. be valuable to them as customers and and I guess does fairer by design mean companies can't make profit from a sector? No, I, absolutely not. I mean, it's it's all about opening the market up to 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 a section of the population that's been underserved for years. And that's, you know, yes, there are things you can see the you can see it as a problem and an unfair problem that needs to be solved. But it's 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 I see it as a fund, as an as an opportunity for people to actually start to seriously take a look at. There's a really good question from James Mitra who asks, um, hey Emma, uh, are there any particular startups that are tackling the poverty premium that you're particularly excited about at present and why? I mean, obviously our whole portfolio is exciting. Okay. <laughs> But I'm, I'm I'm biased on that. I mean, you know, examples like 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 Wage Stream in the in the financial wellness industry. It's it's become. I I always take it as the case study for for a startup that's that's really at the core of tackling the poverty premium, but also uh, very obviously kind of fast scale and and attracting a lot of uh, a lot of commercial capital. Um, and I think I mean. A company like Waystream really excites me because for me that's that's the kind of you know impact and return type relationship that you really want and and it proves that you can have extremely mission driven founders that that will make a lot of profits but also completely changing the way in which corporates actually see or prioritize financial wellness in order to to, to look after their, their their employees but also massively improve the productivity of said employees yeah well i mean if your um if your employees are not dealing with the, the the sort of mental health challenge that comes with financial health problems then surely they're more productive and i think that's fairly fairly logical but also there are a number of studies that show exactly that so a good yeah. question from uh, 11 of us's own henry egan who asks uh, are there countries that we can look up to uh, that lead the way in tackling the policy premium <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I think good the, question, Henry. <laughs> good question, Henry. Um, I think I think the concept of the poverty premium is actually quite well known in emerging markets. Yeah. Um, really enough, so so it's it's you know like in, for years um, now things like uh, co-op based um, loans or or, or, or microfinance um, institutions are, are trying. I mean, I suppose are trying to kind of tackle poverty from the ground up and empowering people um, to actually, you know, build build a life for themselves. I know it's not quite tackling all the aspects of the poverty premium in the UK, but I think it's the, it's the concept of not, not assuming that people are doing something wrong or that they don't know how to manage their finances. It's just that you need to empower them um, and and recognise their vulnerability and that they're, 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 they're time poor, so you have to adapt the the, the 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 goods and services and how they're they're, they're uh, kind of produced and and given in order in order for the the, the customers to thrive so yeah. I, I think I think that's that's an interesting angle but yeah I mean the poverty premium is not a UK only thing like it's you know if you take the the student debt issue in the US I mean you could spend hours trying to kind of unpick that <laughs> <laughs> oh yes you could um can you explain i believe you have a three-year strategy do you want to just give us the highlights of, of what that is i mean it's, it's the, the 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 fund itself is 10 years uh, right now we're, we're halfway through our journey but we have kind of identified that that with covid um it was it was almost kind of a shame to to end the deployment period of the fund um next year um, so, so we're extending the current fund uh, by by five million and another eighteen months worth of deployment period uh, to 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 be to be able to find those innovators post COVID that that kind of are getting uh, are getting driven to solve some some of those issues. Um, but you know, the the aim for us is to to have a portfolio of of companies that 
you know, are as diversified as possible in the in the poverty premium drivers that they're tackling, but also um, try and be as complementary as possible and can act as a as a um, evidence base for for the the campaign to 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 do their, their kind of influencing influencing work. So a success for us is to actually reduce the premium through through the startups, but it's also act as a as a catalyst um, to to bigger change happening through 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 the campaign. So it's kind of a, a micro and macro change. It, both impact and return, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, more questions flying in. So I'm going to sneak in one more from Paul Loberman, uh, who asks, are you seeing good initiatives or progress at incumbent financial services institutions on this topic at all? Definitely. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's two things that, that, that corporates can do. They can they can partner with startups, which, you know, we're trying to encourage, but they can also um, they can also innovate, innovate in house or do both. And, you know, but there are there are um, financial institutions that are especially now actually post COVID that are really that are trying to allocate more and more budgets to um, to trying to to kind of yeah look after look after their vulnerable customers better whilst making profits on it. Um, things like you know adopting digital training services uh, for their more vulnerable customers for them is is. Um, for some banks is actually a, a, a good business case and I know that a bank is working with one of our digital um, training startup to do that. There's also, I mean, you know, through, through, through Credit Kudos, for example, I see that there's a lot more um, banks, small and medium financial institutions as well, that are, that are really um, wanting to get on the open banking bandwagon and, and really making the effort to opening up their existing um, lending value chain to to open banking. Um, Indeed. So there's a, there's a really good friend of 11 of us called John Hope Bryant, and uh, he's uh, the CEO and founder of something called Operation Hope. And uh, he had he has a sentence that really really stuck with me, which is uh, in the U.S. in particular, you never see riots in a 700 credit score neighborhood. Um, the issue is poverty, and actually, that that a lot of society's ills can really be overcome. And this this um, credit score is a passport to freedom. Credit score and financial literacy are a passport to hope, and and that can make such a difference on on people's lives. And as somebody who was brought up by a wonderful single mom who probably struggled too much with her finances, I really hope you guys do exceptionally well. So I want to ask the question: um, Where can people find out more about what you're doing? And um, if people are interested in your fundraise, what do they need to know as well? I mean, best best thing is is uh, go on to the Essential Ventures website um, on the on the Fair by Design Fund page, or you can you can reach me um, on LinkedIn. Um, but you know, it's 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 mainly um, trying trying to reach out to us and see if you can help. I mean, it's, it's yes, we are fundraising, but there's also we're, we're always looking for people um, that are ready to mentor these these um, startups. Um, you know, prefer as deal flows. There's various different ways in which in which you can help. So um, don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Emma. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you, everybody, for your amazing questions. Really good engagement today. I'm sure you've got days to get to. But uh, on Monday, Sam Moore is talking to Adam Carson from Point72 Ventures. It's a venture theme lately. Uh, have a good weekend, everybody, and goodbye for now. Good. Goodbye.